Now I would like to give the floor to the second lecture. It's Professor Maurizio Perizzini, who was very well known as a scientist and personality, not only in phosphorus chemistry. His biography is so rich that I am not going to, to present it. But for two years, he is a director of the Department of Chemical Sciences and Technologies of Materials of the National Research Council in Italy. And he is an author of, of over 350 papers, which are well cited. He is known all over the world. Uh, he has probably beat world record in presentation of lectures at 80 universities. Mauricio. <laughs> thank you so much. So you are really so kind, too much kind. Anyway, thank you for your very kind presentation and thank you to the organizing committee, especially to Clara and Eva Marie, for giving me the opportunity to duplicate the presentation of PBS High meeting. And uh, indeed, uh, this is the title of my presentation. <clears throat> and uh, uh, you will see here that uh, this is a sort of continuation of what happened just uh, one year and a few months uh, ago uh, in, uh, in Paris. This is a picture of Paris. Unfortunately, I missed the picture yesterday. I'm very sorry with the organized. You can take a picture of mine and put this atop uh, the other picture, yes, in the cloud or something like that. Anyway, this was the nice picture that we did in Paris. At, at that time, in Paris, I was invited to talk, and uh, my title is there present, is as indicated, playing with uh, phosphorus uh, allotropes from <laughs> organometallic chemistry to innovative 2D materials. But once uh, I started the presentation, and even just a few days before, I realized that uh, I was too much ambitious, and I could not cover all the topics that I would like to cover. And so this was the outline of my presentation at that time, but I was capable only of talking about uh, white phosphorus, that is organometallic chemistry of white phosphorus and coordination chemistry of white phosphorus. That is the way by which white phosphorus interacts with the transition metal ligand system and the way by which it is activated by transition metal, li system, transition metal ligand system to do some uh, chemical functionalization of uh, P atoms. And so, moving from uh, PBS High 2017 to PBS High 2018, I decided just to switch the title, the presentation, trying to focus on uh, black, black phosphorus. And my idea is to show you that uh, the chemistry of, white of black phosphorus is uh, the one that is capable of changing a sort of ugly duckling to a black swell. Let's see if uh, this is uh, true. This is the how to line, but it is not nice to stay here because it's too, too far. So uh, this is the how to line of my presentation. I would like then to talk to you about the Hagley duckling, that is uh, the black phosphorus renaissance. And then, thanks to the ERC project that we got three years ago, to uh, move to describe what we are trying to do and what we are do done in the area of black phosphorus. And this is what we are doing in this project. Essentially, we are working with black phosphorus uh, methyl nanoparticles, black phosphorus-based hybrid materials, and then, a, so a very, let's say, in my opinion, very nice high-pressure studies, as well as to model the reactivity of black phosphorus with also transition metal ligand systems. Finally, BP-based heterostructures, and recently we entry in the area of biomedical application using BP as a very nice scaffold to uh, <coughs> to have uh, some interesting applications in, the, in this area. Okay, still uh, very ambitious, and so I remove this part, and we'll try to, 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 to concentrate my lecture on the metal nanoparticles and hybrid materials. In particular, at the very end, I would like to try to show you that really the black, the ugly duckling, is became a beautiful black swell. Okay, so the isolobal uh, relationships uh, which connect uh, Boron, uh, sorry, carbon and fossil is well known. Our, our colleague David has before mentioned the, the, the sort, the, this very nice book, Phosphorus, the Carbon Copy, and has gone beyond the carbon copy. That is absolutely, absolutely true. So uh, we can consider phosphorus and carbon. I say here that there is a, a, a pair of cognate elements as related to the isolobal relationships, and they have 
the characteristic to form allotropic pairs. And so, for the carbon, we have graphite. Graphite can be transformed into diamond at a very high pressure. And graphite can be exfoliated, forming graphene. Carbon exists in nature in uh, some many other different kind of allotropics. Allotropes, the family of McMister fallerins, or fallerins better, and the family of carbon nanotubes and something else. So it's a very complicated family of uh, uh, allotropes, uh, as well as uh, the similar situation is found also for phosphorus. If you move to phosphorus, you start uh, from uh, P4, this beautiful tetrahedral molecule, which was discovered as uh, Eva Maria remember me, just 150 years ago, and it will be celebrated next year probably. And uh, uh, this is the, the famous painting in which uh, uh, the alchemist Brandt in Hamburg discovered white phosphorus, but phos white phosphorus can be transformed, just playing uh, with temperature and pressure into the other allotropic forms. Red phosphorus, a polymeric structure. Uh, black phosphorus, which was uh, firstly obtained by Evie, pressurizing white phosphorus, or red phosphorus also, and it is a, a sort of, tri uh, of uh, bulky materials with a tridimensional structure. Black phosphorus, like, like graphite, can be exfoliated and forming phosphorine, that is the old phosphorus counterpart of graphene. But there exists also some other different phosphorus allotropic forms. I have mentioned here, for example, the beautiful phosphorus nanorods, which, uh, in, <coughs> which uh, um, were worth to, of the cover of Angevante Chemie in 204. Arno Pfizer, if I remember, was the, the author of the discovery in Regensburg, and so on and so, and so forth about phosphorus. The three most important allotrop, allotropic forms of phosphorus are related to the fact that we move from very low reactivity for black, phos black phosphorus to very high reactivity with white phosphorus. Okay, and then let's try to make a sort of conceptual experiment in which we start with graphene, with graphene, sorry. Okay, this is the flat uh, <coughs> surface of hexagonal carbon atoms, and try to add hydrogen to each of these carbon of these carbon atoms. If we had hydrogen to, to each carbon atom, we got a situation which is this one, doing this, which is represented here, and we transform the graphene into graphene. Doing this, the carbon changes its hybridization from sp2 to sp3. And the honeycomb structure of graphene transforms into a corrugated honeycomb network of graphene. That is just this one. Let's try now to consider that there exist isolobal relationships, which in principle related the methane, CH group, to phosphorus atoms. Doing this, it is conceptually possible to replace each CH atom of the graphene into a network of phosphorus atoms in the corrugated forms, hexagonal <coughs> corrugated P6 unit, which is nicknamed phosphorine. And this is the way by which phosphorine can be conceptually related to graphene. Okay. Let's see now the situation, what happens when uh, graphene was, uh, when, sorry, phosphorine was discovered. This happens in 2014. And this is a perusal of the literature containing the words uh, red, black, and uh, uh, white phosphorus at the time, starting from the year 2000 until 2013. You see that more or less black was practically neglected in the literature. White and red was much more represented, even if not too much. Okay, in 2013, there were, in 2014, sorry, there was uh, the discovery of uh, black, uh, that black phosphorus could be exfoliated, forming uh, phosphorine. That is the single layer, in principle, of phosphorus atoms. And the situation changed completely, and the neglected allotrope became really the black swan. You see here that the number of papers related to phosphorine in green and black phosphorus in black overwhelmed the number of papers related to any of the other phosphorus allotropic forms. And this situation is going on and is continuing to progress in the same direction even in the year 2018 and, I guess, in the future as well. Okay, so the renaissance of black phosphorus was uh, signed by this point. About one century ago, black phosphorus was uh, 
described, and the first three was synthesized at very high pressure. It was a very high pressure transformation of white phosphorus and red phosphorus as well, 1914. Then the, the, the standpoints were the development of the, 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 the development of the idea that uh, it was a, a semiconductor, and uh, this happened about uh, and a half of the last century. Then it was, uh, this is a very important point, it was synthesized at room temperature without in using high pressure equipments. And then in 2014, it was the first publication, there was the first publication of a black phosphorus layered thin films that are phosphorine indeed. And these were immediately understood to be extremely important from a physics point of view because they had a very singular characteristic that are completely different from that of graphene. In particular, the high electronic mobility that is uh, uh, unusual for this kind of compound, as well as the anisotropic uh, uh, anisotropic properties of uh, uh, phosphorine, which has related to the corrugated form of this uh, material. You have here a sort of a comparison of a different, uh, of different uh, uh, compound, which uh, belongs to the growing family of 2D materials, graphene, phosphorine, and the other members of the graphene family, silicine, zermanine, and stannine, which has been all described and, uh, until the, there is a lot of problems in, in reproducing the synthesis of this compound. And here you see two important examples, the hexagonal boronitride, which has been <coughs> presented before by Professor Miel, and uh, as well as uh, the, 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 the transition metal dichalcogenides here represented by molybdenum and disulfide, which is a very important to the materials, which is largely used for electronic application. You see here a comparison between graphene and phosphorine, and what is important in this <coughs> comparison, which was published in 2015, is the fact that immediately it was recognized that changing carbon with phosphorus is not so trivial. And phosphorus has a lot of difference with respect to carbon. And particularly, while graphene is extremely stable under normal conditions, so that it, could not, it is not necessary to protect, in general, this compound. For uh, phosphorine, the situation is absolutely different because phosphorine is extremely, is very reactive with light, water, hay, and so a protective coating is needed for application of this, uh, let's say, new and uh, tantalizing material, at least uh, for physics. Again, you see here a comparison between, uh, this is a, let's say, a representation of the structure of phosphorine. You see here the, van de, uh, so the, the, the layers of P6 on a comb corrugated uh, material, which are held together by weak Wonder, Van der Waals interaction. And you see here that uh, there are uh, many important differences, in particular, the uh, phosphorine, the phosphorine has a band gap which is a, a, extremely higher with respect to the black phosphorus itself. And what is important, this band gap can be tuned by changing the thickness of the phosphorine, of the phosphorine flakes. This is the, the, the property, the other important properties, that is the anisotropic properties of, uh, uh, of phosphorine. You see here the arm chair, which is along the Higgs axis, and you see here the other zigzag uh, axis, that is the Y axis, and you see that uh, the properties of the material quite, you see here, the properties of the material are quite different. So that, for example, the thermal conductivity can be controlled just in one direction, for example, with respect to the other one, and the electronic mobility can be controlled also just in a single direction with respect to the other one. Okay, this is just a representation of some uh, uh, anisotropic characteristic of the material. You see here that uh, the, uh, <coughs> the band gap can be tuned depending on the number of layers, and that is the thickness of the phosphorine flakes. And you see here the in-plane in anisotropy uh, of optical and transport properties of uh, this uh, material. Okay, this is a comparison of the band gap properties of the different 2D materials. You see here uh, black phosphorus and phosphorine are here, more or less, they cover a very interesting range. And what is important, again, is that the band gap and <coughs> depends strongly from the thickness of the material. And increase when the flakes became, uh, go to the monolayer about uh, two electron volt, more or less. 
Okay, and this is just the title of the project, of the ERC project that uh, we presented in 2014 and was funded in 2015. Uh, it was uh, nicknamed the Phosphan, that is uh, fun with phosphorus, in my opinion, but uh, the, the, the word Phosphan was interpreted as phosphorine functionalization, a new platform for advanced multifunctional material. Uh, this is the, the, the name of the people that work on the project Phosphan since uh, its uh, beginning. You see here people working at uh, CNR, mostly, almost all at the CNR in Florence. This is the, the, the Institute of Chemistry of Organometallic Compounds. Working in Pisa, they are physics, and in Bologna, also physics. Uh, working uh, in uh, CNR as well, they are two different institutes of CNR. Okay, and this is the, the five different work packages that we uh, <coughs> proposed in the project. The first one was the synthesis because we need to synthesize and to, to learn how to synthesize this material, which was just described in the same year in, we, in which we presented the application. Then we have to study, and this is the most important, in my opinion, the most important from a chemical viewpoint uh, work package, the, to study the reactivity and the possibility to functionalize uh, black phosphorus, then to use uh, doping procedure to get compounds with different physical properties related to black phosphorus as well, heterostructures and applications in different areas, especially in electronics, optics and catalysis. Okay, and this is uh, the way by which we synthesize black phosphorus in our laboratory. This is a modification of the synthesis which was reported in 2007. We started from red phosphorus, which is not harmful at all, and we reacted it at very high temperature for a long time in the presence of a catalytic amount of tin tetraiodide and tin. And at the very end of the reaction, we got extremely good quality crystals. You see here a representation of the material which is inside the, uh, the, the, the quartz vial, which was characterized by conventional method uh, in particular uh, X-ray powd powder diffractograms uh, to be the black phosphorus uh, as we suppose to be. And this is a representation of uh, <coughs> scanning electron microscopy of black phosphorus. It's a beautiful material even from uh, electron microscopy, uh, let's say, viewpoints. And some characterization, conventional characterization about the Raman the absorption of uh, black phosphorus good are, uh, are <coughs> Raman active. And of course, the other techniques that we use was uh, uh, atomic force microscopy to get information about the surface of the flakes in particular. So again, the most important properties, the band gap was tunable depending on the layer number. The anisotropy in plane, which is important for the electronic properties of the material. And the big problem, phosphorine flakes were reactive with respect to air. And you see here what happens, for example, for a sample of phosphorine, which was immediately fabricated and which after a few times start to decompose and to transform into something else. You see that the flakes, a nice flakes of phosphorine of uh, lift to, uh, leave to, uh, left to the, to, to, to the air, transforms and degrades a lot into a couple of uh, weeks, for example. Also, the way to do this, and uh, uh, of course, uh, this is another representation. You see here the Raman signal suppression is a good indicator of uh, BP oxidation. And the way to uh, protect black phosphorus is to use a sort of coating, which is absolutely necessary to uh, protect black phosphorus. In the while, people in the world there was uh, uh, increasing the number of publication of white phosphorus. And you see here, this is a, an, a nice representation what is possible to do with black phosphorus, black phosphorus and exfoliated black phosphorus, I would like to say. And you see here there are many applications. Some of them are real applications, others are just at the beginning of their story. But you see that they cover almost all the area of modern uh, let's say, and a la page, I would like to say, chemistry and physics and of material science. This is the way by which uh, uh, black phosphorus was prepared in the original paper of uh, Ye and co-workers. 
It was uh, just the simple way to uh, prepare this material by mechanical exfoliation using the scotch tape, and it was possible to get, uh, by peeling, uh, see, uh, almost uh, very, very uh, few layers, uh, let's say, few layers, uh, uh, flakes of uh, phosphorin. It was published in 2014, indeed. And in the same year in Kencom, there was a publication describing the application of uh, uh, wet methods to produce uh, exfoliated black phosphorus. This was uh, published in uh, Kencom, and uh, the, the different solvent can be used, dimethyl sulfoxide, dimethyl formamide, or, <coughs> or py py pyrolidone solvents. We studied at the beginning the liquid exfoliation of uh, uh, white phosphorus, and uh, demonstrated that uh, so uh, a very small amount of water seems to be necessary to get uh, good quality crystals of phosphorin. In particular, what we demonstrate was that uh, if uh, we are in the condition that are here represented in the condition C, in which there is uh, almost a very few amount or dry conditions of water, you see that uh, we have uh, stored the, uh, the, the, the composition that start to be very, very quick. And uh, what happens was studied by NMR spectroscopy. You see here a solution, a suspension, sorry, a suspension of phosphorine in dimethyl sulfoxide. And you see that immediately signals uh, belonging to oxidized phosphorus species starts to appear in the spectrum. And in very few time, about 14 hours, all the phosphorus in solutions is in the form of this uh, trimetaphosphate H2P309 minus, this is an ion of trimetaphosphate, which is uh, the, only the only product after one day or so, 20 hours. Okay, the, the, the product was characterized by mass spectral analysis. It is this one. And uh, an interpretation was done also by, of the formation was done uh, by attributing a role to dimethyl sulfoxide. This is the proton and carbon NMR spectrum of a solution of a suspension containing phosphorine. And you see that together with the signal dimethyl sulfoxide, we see also the signal of dimethyl sulfide here and here. And on going on with the time, you see that this signal goes increase in intensity and we suppose that dimethyl sulfoxide is not innocent for this, uh, is not innocent for this kind of, uh, uh, <coughs> let's say, chemistry. Indeed, our theoreticians have calculated that dimethyl sulfoxide can transfer under proper condition the oxygen atom, forming then dimethyl sulfide, to one of the phosphorus atoms, starting the degradation of phosphorine and its transformation into the trimetaphosphate. Let's move now to chemistry, because uh, chemistry of phosphorine is so important. Here are some, uh, some reasons. Because uh, if we are capable of modifying uh, black phosphorus, we can uh, contribute to stabilize this compound, and we can contribute to modify this compound, and particularly to fine-tuning its fi physical properties, which is extremely important to prepare new, de new device. For the moment in the literature, this is a very hard uh, uh, hard <coughs> story because uh, practically, in spite of the many attempts, uh, these are the only two reported uh, covalent functionalization of, uh, uh, covalent functionalization of uh, uh, black phosphorus, of uh, phosphorine. One is related to the formation of, the, of diazonium salt, and the other one to the formation of uh, alkyl aryl halides atop the surface. But both the papers have uh, some uh, questions and uh, some of these results are not really easily reproducible. And uh, as what we have gone, done in this area was uh, to try to, 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 to modify the surface of uh, uh, black phosphorus and phosphorine by putting atop uh, metal nanoparticles. To prepare metal nanoparticles, we use uh, the method which was developed in Toulouse by uh, Nicole uh, Mesaillet, and, uh, and this is a very, sim very, 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 very simple method. And uh, start, for example, with uh, nickel acetyl acetonate, octyl amine, and uh, trioctyl phosphine, oleyl amine and trioctyl phosphine, and got very nice uh, metal nanoparticles, which are here 
uh, presented in these uh, <coughs> micrographs. And uh, once we have prepared these nanoparticles, we put uh, them together with uh, exfoliated, freshly exfoliated phosphorin, and uh, we got the formation of uh, we got the formation of uh, decorated nanoflakes of phosphorin with uh, metal nanoparticles. You see here the decoration, and uh, you see here another representation. This is, uh, depends uh, from the, 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 the number, of course. So this is a very rich uh, surface uh, of, uh, very rich, a very metal rich surface of uh, um, <coughs> phosphorine eh, co covered by uh, nickel nanoparticles as well. And uh, let's go ahead. This is uh, a nice uh, electron microscopy of uh, uh, the uh, nanoparticles, uh, which are mostly located at the edge of the flakes of phosphorin. Okay, time is up, and so I have still some slides. Um, and uh, oh, time is up. And uh, okay, so we, 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 we develop just, uh, I finish just this part. We, we, we develop uh, some study to understand the interaction between the nickel nanoparticles and the black phosphorus. And uh, we apply then uh, this material to study a test reaction that is the cymetrogenation of phenylacetylene. Just to be quick, just to be quick, we have we got very good we got very good results in the uh, semitrogenation of phenylacetylene, and we got very uh, nice results in recycling the catalyst. And uh, to, we studied also the decomposition. We did the same experiment also. Uh, <coughs> with the palladium, and we applied, you see in one of the other slides, in the case of palladium, we suppose that a covalent interaction is possible, you see here, for example, that we applied this palladium uh, catalyst as a very interesting catalyst for getting the reduction of nitrarines to aniline, and nitrarines to aniline, with very good, uh, very good selectivity and very good conversion, indeed. Okay, this is just a summary of the first part, which will be also the, 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 the next part will be uh, presented in the future. Give me, Pavel, give me just a few, few, few couple of minutes more. I don't speak about this part, which is very interesting. So it's a way to prepare black phosphorus in, in situ, practically. Black phosphorus is foliated, black phosphorus in situ. And I skip all this part, which is related to polymer chemistry. And this is the people that I would like to thank. This is the people who work with me in Florence in the, uh, in the project FOSFAN. This picture was taken just uh, uh, one month ago. This is the people which is working with me. They are physicists in uh, Pisa. And this is the people which is working in Bologna. Many collaborations in different parts of Italy, Pisa, Cosenza, Naples, Turin, and Padua. And this is the message that I would like to, to convey to you before finishing. Uh, we are going to organize a very important conference in uh, 2020, the 14th International Conference on Coordination Chemistry. This is the website, which will be open in a few days, in the year 29 in January, I guess. And uh, this is, okay, the invitation to come from me and the other organizer. See you in Rimini 2020. And this is the, uh, the leaflet that uh, you have uh, the possibility to collect uh, in the room. So... Uh, this is just to thank you for your kind attention. Thank you so much. Now we have a time for one or two questions. <coughs> thank you very much. Um, yes, so uh, very interesting results, fascinating. Um, as we managed the miracle to um, be from five minutes late, we are now ten minutes early. Yeah. Um, yes, so I, I'd like to ask a question. I'd like to, like to ask a question uh, uh, which is a bit off topic concerning the silly scene that mm. you have shown us, right? And you said that this is kind of, uh, it w was difficult to reproduce. So I, I'm absolutely convinced that the work by Balakrishnan is largely neglected in the area because I think it's absolutely impossible to have a monolayer of silicine. It will distort uh, in the way that, uh, in a way very similar to what was predicted by Balakrishnan, and, and then give an extremely puckered surface yeah. 
um, which is actually not so dissimilar to, to the black phosphorus. Yes, for what I know, I, I never worked with uh, silicon in this area, but for what I know, so the, 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 the first results which were claimed were not reproduced by other people. Mm -hmm. Maybe that you know quite better than me. This, this. So, uh, so the claiming of silicine, Germ germanine and stannin, let's say, are really not, not perfectly confirmed for what I know. Yeah, I agree. Thank you. Hello. Again, very, very, very nice uh, talk. You. I enjoy it very much. Uh, th there is one, one thing that is strange to me. You, you mentioned in uh, your work that the black phosphorus is unreactive. On the contrary, you exfoliate it, you yeah. get the, 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 the outer layers, and then this phosphorine is extremely reactive. Yeah. That's strange. This seems because, strange indeed. Because if you do by exfoliation, that means that it was in the surface of the black uh, phosphorus. So why the surface is so reactive? But on the contrary, you, you mentioned, or it is written, that the black phosphorus is... Uh, and then, uh, in this way, I can put a second one. Uh, what about the surface, the surface area of black phosphorus? So, so the second question is, uh, is similar. We try to use uh, this material even bef before exfoliating heat, uh, just to, to see if it's possible to uh, absorb, physically absorb hydrogen inside. And uh, we didn't observe, there is a, we didn't observe practically absolutely good absorption of gases in this area. So I think that really the material is uh, not porous at all. And uh, from the other side, uh, I think that uh, black phosphorus is a reactive material, providing that you find the right conditions. We have not yet started, but I guess that it could be a, an excellent source of uh, a single and polyphosphorus units, providing that you uh, expose that uh, to, the, to the proper con reaction conditions. For example, uh, uh, we have the indication that you can extrude from uh, black phosphorus uh, three phosphorus unit that could be stabilized by different transition metal ligand systems forming cyclotriphosphorus complexes. This can be done. So it's not really true that it's not reactive. Probably phosphorus is a mass, is a bulk material, and uh, there is a strong interaction between the different layers that, uh, that can be removed by mechanical exfoliation. So uh, the this, this single layer is uh, very strong, but uh, it is, uh, let's say, uh, separated by uh, weak interaction with the other layers. The five angstrom separation are in this sense. The point is that once you have removed, let's say, ideally, just a single layer of phosphorus atoms, a single flake of phosphorus atom, you get a, a corrugated surface which is uh, exposed at a variance with graphene, to, uh, which has exposed at variance with graphene uh, with, uh, uh, let's say, long pairs on the phosphorus surface, and these are very good point of attack, for example, for oxygen atoms, and uh, which produce the oxidation that we find, for example, in the system when uh, the, 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 the water degradation in the presence of dimethyl, uh, dimethyl sulfoxide is used. So uh, I think that we, have, uh, we should have ma much many surprises in this chemistry because uh, uh, it is not perfectly true that uh, uh, the compound is uh, so inert. And uh, uh, that's uh, the story for which we have a very uh, exciting results in the area of the using of this material for biomedical application. For example, we see that uh, phosphorus uh, layer of pho uh, sorry, phosphorus flakes of phosphorine can be used as a very good support to, uh, uh, to, to host and to uh, stimulate the growth of uh, Osteo, osteocy osteocytes, osteocytes, and uh, they form, okay, this is not what, what, what my colleague is saying, they are forming in proper condition a sort of uh, apatites that is absolutely compatible with the, the, the t -t uh, bone tissue regeneration and similar. We have, we have a patent on, on, on this area. And uh, so. Okay, thank you. Let's thank both lectures were very exciting lectures. Thank you so much.